Thanks for checking out this movie analysis video. Uh, I Yes, there is going to be a difference. I'm not going to call these in-depth uh, reviews um, reviews anymore. I'm going to call them analyses. So these types of films where people ask me, hey, can you watch this movie and like really break it down, those will be called movie analysis. And the ones where I just kind of watch a movie, I don't really take notes or think super hard into the themes and everything and just kind of give like a quicker review of it. I will call those movie review. So just know that up front. The other thing, please hit subscribe if you like any videos you see on my site or on my channel. It can really help me out because more viewers and that's great. And I'd like more participation as well. Comments down below, thumbs ups and the subscribing really helps. And you too can request a movie for me to do either a review or an analysis of uh, just make a comment below and ask for that but you also have to be a subscriber too so hit that uh, anyway this one is for the people under the stairs it's a film from 1991 and this is done for subscriber b camp 1390 uh, once again that's b c a m p 1390 so thank you for this recommendation this is actually a film i haven't watched in quite a while i it's been at least five years at least five years since i've watched this film so it's kind of nice to just go back because every passing year my recollection of films kind of gets a little bit hazier so it's good for refreshers so let me talk a little bit about um some behind the scenes stuff production you know money all that kind of stuff first uh, and then I'll get into my kind of feelings on the film, things I broke down while I was watching it. And I have all my notes right here. Yeah, it's actually a decent amount. It's a decent amount of notes. Anyway, um, so this, as people may or may not know, I hope they know, this is a Wes Craven film. He wrote it and directed it. Uh, like I said, it was came out in 1991. The budget for this one was $6 million. And it was kind of a surprise. People didn't expect it to be super profitable, but it was. It made $31.4 million at the box office, which is pretty big off of a $6 million budget. $6 million even back then was considered to be relatively low budget. So for this to perform like that, they were like, oh man, awesome. So uh, because of how well it performed and how well people have kind of thought of it over the years, there was, it's a little further down in my information, but yeah, um, Wes Craven had actually talked about remaking this film at some point. He also talked about remaking The Last House on the Left, as well as his film Shocker, which I have not seen Shocker. That one's on my list, along with a ton of other horror films to see. Uh, I will eventually. So the re there eventually was a remake of The Last House on the Left, uh, and it didn't do great. So after that, the, the talk of redoing Shocker and the talk of redoing The People Under the Stairs kind of faded away until 2015 when Wes Craven actually said he was working on a TV series for The People Under the Stairs for the Sci-Fi Channel. I didn't know this. I found this in my research. I was like, oh, wow. But the problem is 2015 was the year that he passed away. He passed away in August of 2015. And all of us in the horror community, as we know, we were super sad because we lost an amazing filmmaker, amazing filmmaker. Uh, and they, he and there were he and three others that were the big horror film directors from his class of filmmakers. It was uh, Wes Craven, Toby Hooper, George A. Romero, and John Carpenter. And of those four, only John Carpenter's still alive. So kind of sad at this point. And once John Carpenter's gone, it's you know, that, that class of filmmakers is gone. It's sad. But moving forward, uh, so Everett McGill and Wendy Roby, I don't know if it's Roby or Robbie, those were the two main villains in this film. Oh, by the way, this will have spoilers. As it's an analysis of the film, it definitely has spoilers. You should assume that. Uh, so yeah, so Everett McGill and Wendy Roby, they ended up being cast as the main villains in this film because of their role as a interesting married couple in the Twin Peaks series, which had, I believe, aired in 1990, 89 or 90. I can't remember exactly which. I love Twin Peaks. Uh, to hear this information, I was like, oh, that's super cool. I love Twin Peaks. Um, I still haven't gotten through all the way the, the new season that was on Showtime. Uh, it was super, super slow and not in the same spirit as the first two seasons. So eventually I will finish it out, but I'm mainly just a fan of the original two seasons. So, um, 
All right, so yeah, so that's why they were chosen. I think they did a really good job. Well, Wes Craven did a really good job choosing those individuals because they do an excellent job of keeping up the evil, and their acting is great. So this film, actually, if you're a big fan of The People Under the Stairs, there was a Blu-ray release for it, coincidentally, in 2015, the year that Wes Craven passed away, done by Scream Factory. Now, Scream Factory is an arm of Shout Factory, who does a lot of really good Blu-ray releases nowadays. Um, most recently, last year, I bought their special release on Blu-ray of Trick or Treat. Trick or Treat, not Trick or Treat. And it was awesome. The extras on there, the way it looks, it's phenomenal. So Scream Factory does an awesome job. And Shout Factory, they do a great job. So if you are into this film, it's out there. You can get it on their website. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say up front before getting more into it, well, there's a little bit more. Uh, Brandon Quinton Adams plays the main character in this, the kid known as Fool. And I honestly think that as far as child acting goes, he did a really good job. There's some good child acting acting out there, in especially in the older films. He's like, he's up there, to be honest. His role in this did a great job. Great job. Um, Wes Craven had, had been recorded as saying that his idea for writing the script for this film was an actual news story that he saw where some burglars had broken into a house in Los Angeles. And because they broke in, it brought the police to the house and they inadvertently discovered that the people living there had been keeping their two kids locked up like under lock and key basically like i don't want to say inappropriately but criminally basically and he saw the story and he was just kind of like oh that gives me an interesting idea for a script so knowing that and going into watching the film you can definitely see that train of thought and how he got there how he got to what he has because of that so that's really interesting. Okay, let's get into the actual film now, like the actual events of the film itself. So one of the main things that hit home for me very early on is it hits the theme of gentrification very, very hard. I don't know if people understand um, the term gentrification or not. I'm sure a lot of people watching this do know it, but just in case, I'll kind of talk about gentrification a little bit. So gentrification is basically the idea of... Um, an area that is populated by people who are in a lower income situation and people who are much richer, higher income coming in, trying to price those people out of their housing, um, sometimes actually physically forcing them out, just saying, you know, we're not going to allow you to renew your lease and you got to find somewhere else to live. So basically trying to force poorer people out so that they can remake the neighborhood with, you know, higher class apartments, houses, businesses, stuff like that to kind of like revitalize it. And a lot of the times gentrification is tied into a racist element of, you know, specifically people who are white and rich coming in and trying to push out black, um, black populations. So it's, it's not, I don't think by definition it has to be racially motivated, but I think a lot of the times it is tied into being racially motivated throughout history and even currently. So there's that. But they really hit that element a lot in this, and you can really see it when, you know, Fool is with his family, and you're seeing that they're living in just, like, horrible situations. They're very poor. They're having a hard time paying their rent. His um, mother is even dying from cancer. And they even say at one point, I think it's Ving Rhames' character who says, you know, she could get treatment right now for what she has and she could end up being fine. The problem is you don't have any money. And that's kind of like making this point of something that persists today even that's ridiculous is the fact that you have to have money to maintain health. And it's not just access to health care, which is ridiculous in my opinion, but also access to healthier foods. You know, there's a, there's a big correlation from what I understand um, with studies done of people who are much lower income who end up eating a lot of fast food because it's cheap and it'll fuel their bodies. It's not good for them and it's bad for their health long term, but that's what they can afford. So they're kind of forced into this situation where they have to be less healthy because they're not making as much money as other people who can afford to go out and buy, like, 
the highest quality food because they have a much higher paycheck and they therefore have better health and they can also afford you know to go to the doctor all the time because they can afford health insurance and it's just this whole thing that i think is hit very hard in the beginning of this film and it makes a very important point so if you just listen to that and you're like man this is a little bit political i mean it is but that's the film like the actual film is very political and I think that a lot of these types of themes were starting to hit film hardest in this time period. You know, like I said, 1991 is when this came out. And that's when a lot of these things like gentrification and, you know, income inequality and stuff like that started really getting to be uh, talked about even more in just film itself. Not just like on a social level, because it all, it, you know, well before this in a, on a social level, but more in film. So moving on. Um. Oh, the other thing about uh, about the gentrification in this is the main bad guys are kind of kind of have this view of, you know, if if we start pushing everyone out, we take all their money basically, and then we, you know, make sure that they can't stay here, and then we'll rebuild uh, to make this place, you know, a higher higher income area. They're they're equating that with pushing the bad element out of the neighborhood, so adding a little bit more evil to it. Um, I already talked about the health care thing. I'm sorry, I'm reading down my notes to make sure I hit everything that I wrote down. Uh, so, yeah, so the issue of, of the lower income individuals not being able to, you know, pay their rent and have health coverage and stuff like that, it's creates, it shows how it creates very dire situations in which people do things that they normally would not do because it's kind of a um, survival thing. You know, you can see it with the character Fool where he's just a good kid. And everyone recognizes that in the film. And he's set up that way from the beginning. He's a good kid. He doesn't want to do anything against the law. He doesn't want to do anything bad. But he gets talked into breaking into the house of these main villains uh, by Ving Rhames' character because he's in a terrible situation. And as Ving Rhames puts it to him, you know, there's something you can do about your mother dying. And so he internalizes that and is kind of like, you know, what's my other option? You know, faced with keeping your mother or losing her, like, what what's his choice really supposed to be? So he reluctantly goes along with, after much turmoil that you can see in the film, he reluctantly goes along with this plan. But, as it turns out, when, when they finally get into the house and... Um, they start looking around and everything. It ends up being a very good thing that they broke into the house because there's some messed up stuff going on there. As people, I'm sure you've seen this. If you're watching this right now and you haven't watched the movie, please stop. Go back, watch the film, and then come back and watch this because you, you're going to have it spoiled. Um, so one thing I really don't like about this film, it, it's pretty minor, but I think kind of major at the same time, is that the... I feel like they made a mistake in introducing the inner house dwellers. I guess I'll put them that way. Uh, introducing them a little too early. There's that moment very early on in the house where the girl, I think her character's name's Alice, like has, I believe it's Roach's arm who's living in the in the walls. He like, his arm comes out of the vent and hands her the fork that her parents are looking for. Like, oh, you lost the fork. Um and that tells you immediately that there are people kind of like living in there. But then so does the actual title of the film, The People Under the Stairs. So this kind of ties into two things that are part of one thing that I don't like about it. I think it's a mistake, first of all, to call it The People Under the Stairs. Should have called it something else because you're giving away a key part of the film that you could have kept a secret and had a really cool reveal at some point. But also the super early introduction of Roach's arm, which gives you the idea that there's definitely something going on here. Just think about how much better and how much more effective and scary and creepy this film would have been if you go through all the other events leading up to the like full-on reveal of the people in the walls and under the stairs. Like how much better that would be tension-wise and um, interest-wise. Because you just kind of be like, wait, what, what's going on there? What, what's happening there? Who's doing this? The problem is you're set up from the get-go of knowing like, oh, there's people under the stairs. There's people, other people living in this house who are probably being held against their will. So it kind of gives that away. I'd like it to be more of like a surprise element. But, you know, that's just me. In the comments, let me know your thoughts on that one specifically. So the 
this family, they obviously keep themselves totally locked up and shut off from the rest of the world. And it's a combination of a few different reasons. You get the idea that they're afraid to go outside because they think it's just populated by a very bad element. There's a racist, a racist aspect to it where they're, you know, they don't like people of color. And you can even see that, especially towards the end, where the main female villain almost says the N-word. So like right there, she gets the first letter out and then it like cuts it off. So that is insinuating that yes, all along, because it is a little bit questionable at first. Like, are they actually racist or are they just like complete shut-ins and they don't trust anyone? We don't know. But no, that's that's actually in there to kind of indicate that. Um, so there's that, there's the racism aspect, there's the just fear of going outside aspect and the bad elements in the neighborhood. And then also hiding their secret, which is the people under the stairs, as well as all the money that they've been hoarding from the people who live in the community, and they're just taking that money. And then also the aspect of keeping their daughter on lockdown, which we then find out isn't even actually her their daughter, that they kidnapped her, and they're holding her in the house, um... I initially think that she probably thinks they're holding her in the house because everything's so terrible out in the outside world, which they've been, I'm sure, telling her. And so she's like, oh, they're protecting me, they're protecting me. But then eventually finds out from Fool, no, they, they abducted you as a kid and they're keeping you locked up because they don't want you to get away again. Like, you're not their kid. So there's that aspect too. So there's a lot of levels. And I feel like all over with this film, there's levels, just like lots and lots of levels to it, which is what I like about sitting down and actually analyzing the film. It's one that gives me a lot to work uh, to work out and a lot to think about, and I like that about films. So, um, they did an awesome job in this film with set design. I mean, the look of the house, the outside of it and how dilapidated it looks, the inside of it, also how dilapidated it looks, and just the all the secret passageways, all the traps in there, like it looks creepy, it looks old, it looks not cared for. It's just, they did an awesome job with that. They really, I think that's one of the strengths and I think that does an amazing job at kind of setting the tone for each scene. It, it's the environment of like dirty and grimy and creepy and scary and it just helps the film so much. So I love, love, love that. The other thing is the whole uh, aspect of exploration of the house and when traps kind of pop up here and there, it adds an aspect of intrigue and fun to to uh, the viewer's experience of it. And those are things I really like about movies like this. Awesome. Um, you get the idea in this that, that um, McGill, uh, McGill's character, the main, I think she's called Daddy in this, I'll just call him Daddy, that his character uh, hopes people break into the house. The amount of joy he takes in hunting people down once they've gotten into the house, Fool, um, Ving Rhames' character, I forget his name, and the guy who acts like a, he's part, of, he's with like the power company or something, um, I forget his name too. He, all those people like, oh, well he, actually I don't know if, it's kind of not covered I think it's kind of insinuated that the guy who acts like he's part of like the power company or whatever, that he just gets um, killed by the people under the stairs. But I guess you can't be sure. But anyway, when people get into the house, obviously Daddy has a very good time hunting them down. So you just get the idea that he's so sick and twisted that he hopes, he sits around hoping for people to break into the house so that he can go after them and kill them. It's nuts. Uh, and that just ratchets things up. It just, it just, it adds to the evil, which I'll talk a little bit more about that in a little bit. So I think this is a perfect personification, this whole movie of the what goes on behind closed doors thing. There's always this feeling uh, amongst people, and especially within the horror community when it comes to horror films, of like this intrigue of what goes on behind closed doors. And it's, it's a theme that comes up in a lot of films, and it's not just horror, it's in like crime films and drama, and just like all sorts of genres and subgenres of film. And I think it's very effective because it's super interesting. People are always into, you know, what's being hidden. You know, what's, what's the secret there? So I think that works very well for this. Uh, another thing this really does well is it exemplifies the innocence of children and the tainting influence of adults. Because if you think about it, the overwhelming majority of adults who get good screen time in this film are not good. 
you know, a lot of them are, are terrible and terrible to meh, and but all the kids are really good. All the kids are innocent. So it's this this theme of like here are these innocent kids put in these terrible situations and these adults are tainting them by forcing their values and their actions onto them. So there's that. Uh, there are comedic aspects of this film that was intentional with the creation of it. Uh, I think that works for the most part because of the absurdity of the way the two main villains were written and acted. I think they kind of like ratchet things up to like 11 in order to um, kind of meet the comedic uh, aspects of the film. And I think because of that reason, the comedic moments kind of work. And I think in particular, McGill's character of Daddy, um, yeah, like he is the most ridiculous, obviously. And that kind of helps the comedic moments come about. And he actually has most of the comedic moments, to be honest. And a lot of it's like physical comedy. So um, another aspect in this film of the rich feeding on the poor, but it's not just, I mean, it's shown as like financially feeding on the poor. Uh, which we can easily see when they find, uh, well, first of all, they, they, excuse me, first of all, they talk about the aspect of them owning all these buildings and just taking money from people and looking for making more profit, more profit, more profit. Then we find that they have a whole room with all these gold coins and all this money that they've been taking from people and they're not even doing anything with it. It's just like, they're just holding it and like looking at it, just hoarding money, which is like even more evil than taking people's money and using it. Uh, it's just that next level. But it's not just that, but it's also physically, in the film, physically feeding on the poor because the moment where he's, um, where Daddy is cutting up Ving Rhames, uh character and he physically eats part of him. Now that's just kind of like the next ridiculous step to say, you know, we've been hinting at and talking about the fact that these richer people are feeding on the poor, but here's this this kind of screen gag of he's now physically feeding on a poorer person. So, but he ends up throwing a bunch of parts to the people under the stairs as well. And they're being forced at that point, those people under the stairs, to partake in this, these cannibalistic uh, activities because how else are they going to eat? They're not being given anything else. Pretty messed up. Um, mm -mm -mm. So within the relationship between daddy and the mother the mother i don't even remember what her character's name was i don't even know what was really said must have slipped my mind but you can definitely tell that the the relationship there is that he is the is not the thinker that he's kind of the dumb muscle and she's the brains that doesn't have to take a whole lot of action but in the end she has to take action because she's forced into a corner and it's a do or die situation for her so she's the kind of driving force in everything, and he's kind of just the muscle and enjoying when he gets to do his thing. He, kind of like their dog, is her dog, where, you know, she lets him off the chain, and he's even wearing, like, a, a BDSM, like, um, out, full outfit that has, like, collars on it and everything, indicating that he is just like a dog that she's letting off the leash to go after these people. So, yeah. Um, there is a hint at sexual abuse in this that I don't know if people really caught it, but the portion where Alice is chained up towards the end of the film in the basement, I think it's the basement. Was that in the basement or in the attic? I'm sorry. I can't remember. It was one of those top or bottom. I don't know. But when she was chained up there and daddy comes in because he heard some noise, uh, and he's almost to where she is and he starts like kind of rubbing his crotch a little bit it's not super pronounced but if you go back and look for it he starts kind of rubbing his crotch and then he's interrupted by his who seems at first like his wife but is not but maybe is i don't know it's hard to tell uh how they were doing things there um but he's interrupted by her and then he's like oh and he kind of like snaps out of this like psychosexual trance it's it's just that other layer and that's the thing about it is it how it gradually peels back the layers of disgusting and evil with these two main villains it's just like ugh, nasty um so anyway uh 
In my opinion, McGill himself, Everett McGill, is the best part of this film, other than the actual writing of it, because his character is so enjoyable. You can see that his acting, he just went for it. He's over the top, but appropriately so. He's He embodies the character. Like You, you don't see him doing it and think, well, this doesn't make sense for what his character, who his character is supposed to be or what his character does. Like Everything fits, and he just makes it absurd without making it unrealistic, if you know what I mean. But I think he did an awesome job. He's my favorite part of this. He's amazing. But there's a lot of really good stuff about the film. So one of my other gripes with this is the people under the stairs are actually a bit over the top. Uh, the things they have them do are a little bit over the top. Um, how they're kind of like this angry mob. Um, because they make them seem so evil at first. And then you realize, oh, they're not really. They're just kind of forced into this situation. They don't really know what's going on. They're just trying to survive. I feel like they should have played that second aspect the whole time. And I, I don't know. I feel like the way they make them seem a little bit evil is just like over the top. Their physical appearance to like the physical makeup and everything they did with it is very over the top in my opinion as well. They just tried to obviously go more for scary and a little bit less for what would be more realistic in that situation. I mean, if you notice, like, they ha their eyes, like, they have no whites of their eyes. They're just, like, black contacts. And um, they're, like, not just, like, white, but they're kind of greenish. I mean, they would be super white because they're not getting sun, but, the, like, the, the greenish tinge doesn't make sense. It's very weird. I don't know. There's It's just, like, they make them more monster than they would actually be. So just a pet peeve of mine in this film. Um, and then, yeah, finally, the... The final thing I wrote down is the fact that one of the things that really hit for me when they found that room, well, they, when Fool found that room of just all that money and all those gold coins just sitting there, it exemplifies another theme in this, which is, you know, the rich hoarding the wealth, you know, not just taking money from the poor, but just holding it, just holding that wealth and doing nothing with it, just their, their whole aim just being to deprive other people of their money and just hold it and look at it and be like oh look at how much money we have we don't we're not even going to use it we just love looking at it and being greedy and i think that really speaks to not just something that was going on then but something that's going on very strong today which is people who are rich don't really spend their money so much and that's one of the biggest problems with capitalism and that's one of the biggest things that's hinted at in this film is that camp capitalism is so problematic because it creates the stratification of people that you have in this film of the very rich and the very poor and yeah it, I, I think that moment exemplifies more than any of it the fact that you know it's super evil that people who are rich are just collecting endless amounts of wealth and not doing anything with it it's just being wealthy to be wealthy because it makes you feel powerful. But actually, this day and age, it doesn't just make you feel powerful. It legitimately makes you powerful because people get treated differently, you, uh, especially in the court system. I mean, if you have money, you can afford a very awesome lawyer. You can afford health coverage like we were talking about earlier, which means you can live longer. Um, also, the fact that if you have a big corporation or you have enough wealth, you can buy politicians at this point. Literally, as you give certain amounts of money to campaigns, they're going to do you those favors. They're not supposed to, and legally they're not supposed to do that, and legally they'll say they don't do that, but everybody knows that's what happens. So it's kind of this thing that was, um, I, I wouldn't say it was like cutting edge for 1991 to be in there, but uh, it's become more of a common theme as time's gone on. So it was very, um, very what am I looking for here? It was very appropriate to have it in there as a social commentary then, and it persists today. And that's the big thing about this film for me is that it's still relevant. Like there's a lot of stuff, a lot of themes on face value. It might not still seem relevant, but when you dig into it, like this film analysis, it's very relevant. It's a very relevant film today. Okay. So Hopefully everyone enjoyed this. Uh, B Camp 1390, thank you very much for recommending this. It was really fun to do this rewatch and this analysis. Hopefully this is what you were looking for. Hopefully you like this analysis. Put a comment down there. Let me know your feedback on it. Either way, that's fine. Um, so for this film, um, 
a refresher, I do a five uh, out of five star rating, and I can do halves. I'm going to give this a three and a half. It's not quite to a four. I do feel like maybe it could be more like a 3.75, but I don't do that on here. So I'm a little more on the 3.5 for the reasons that I kind of pointed out of like the people on their stairs actually being kind of really overdone, the title of it giving too much away, the early introduction of the people under the stairs kind of giving too much away. Um, yeah, I, I I said that the, the comedy really does work because of the absurdity, absurdity of the villain characters, but there are a few moments that it doesn't really work so much, and it does feel a little out of place. So for that reason, I, I feel like the best I can do is a three three point five three. Well, sorry, three and a half stars. So that's still pretty freaking good. Um, really, if you scale that up, it's seven out of ten. So that's nice. Um, okay, and I'm gonna be doing recommendations. I'm always doing recommendations with these film analyses. Uh, probably won't do it for the movie reviews, but for the film analyses, well, I might for the movie reviews too. I think I have in the past. So for this one, sticking in the same theme, if you liked The People Under the Stairs, I have a film to recommend for you. It doesn't have as many themes, it doesn't have as much subtext or as much to unpack with it, but it has the interesting house, the interesting traps, it's kind of an invasion film, kind of like this is, and that is the film The Collector. And I believe it's by the same people who wrote Saw 4 on... Um, Dustin Melton, I think, and can't remember the other guy's name. But anyway, The Collector. Uh, I've heard mixed reviews on it. I like it. I think it's a fun time. And if you liked the house exploration and the trap aspect of The People Under the Stairs, you should like The Collector. And then there's a sequel. It's not as good. It's called The Collection. It's on a much larger scale, but I enjoy that as well. Not as much as The Collector, but I enjoy that as well. So there's my recommendations, and awesome. So, like I said, put a comment down there. We can talk about whatever, hopefully, about this film. Any other people's thoughts on themes or what did I get right, what did I get wrong, what did I miss? That's another thing. I'm sure I missed some stuff. I can't get everything. But let's comment down there. Give me a thumbs up if you can. And like I said, literally one second. It takes you one second. Just hit that subscribe. It can help me out a lot. And then recommendations. Be a subscriber. Recommend another film. See what I can do. Uh, Camp 1390 thank you. Sorry that it took a while for me to get this out there. But thank you, everyone, and until next time, keep it brutal.